Okay, today we are starting chapter 10. Is this true? I think so. So exciting. Chapter 10 comes a little bit late in the book, I feel, but what do I know? So chapter 10 is all about cadences, phrases, periods, and sentences. Yay. All right. Musical form. Understanding tonal harmony requires more than knowledge of how each chord tends to function harmonically in a progression and how the voice leading might bring the chord into being. We must also give some consideration to musical form. The ways in which a composition is shaped to create a meaningful musical experience for the listener. A thorough study of lengthy compositions is beyond the scope of this text. However, it will be helpful for you to learn something of the harmonic basis of the smaller building blocks that combine to produce larger forms, several of which are introduced in chapter 20. So we're learning all about the form of music. Cadences. Although the ultimate harmonic goal of a tonal composition is the final tonic triad, there will also be many interior harmonic goals found within the piece, some of them tonic triads and some of them not. These interior goals might be reached at a fairly regular rate, often every four measures, or sometimes their appearances might not form a pattern at all. We use the term cadence to mean a harmonic goal, specifically the chords used at the goal. There are several types of cadences commonly found in tonal music. Some cadences sound more or less conclusive or final, where others leave us off balance, feeling a need for the music to continue. Locating the cadences in a composition is easier to do than it is to explain. Remember that what you are listening for is a goal, so there will often be a slowing down through the use of longer note values, but even a piece that never slows down, a perpetuum mobile, will contain cadences. As you listen to the examples in this chapter, you will realize that you are already orally familiar with tonal cadences and that finding them is not a complicated process. I think a lot of you will have an easier time actually hearing these rather than seeing them. But we shall see. There's a standard terminology used for classifying the various kinds of cadences and the terms apply to both major and minor keys. One very important type of cadence consists of a tonic triad preceded by some form of five or seven. This kind of cadence is called an authentic cadence which is an unfortunate term because it implies that all others are less than authentic. The perfect authentic cadence, abbreviated PAC, consists of 5 to 1 or 5 7 to 1 progression, with both the 5 and 1 in root position and scale degree 1 or DO in the melody over the tonic chord. The pack is the most final sounding of all cadences. Most tonal ca compositions end with a pack, but such cadences might, might also be found elsewhere in a piece. Wasn't that nice? That was a pack. Questions so far? Hearing none, seeing none. It's clear as mud. Or it's just Monday. No one wants to talk to me. I showered and everything. Got my Target uniform on, ready for my shift later today. That's cool. Thank you for admitting that. I also have a Jake at State Farm job after that. 
All right. Let me reshare my screen because I know I did not check that box that tells you, that gives you the audio. Question in the chat was, is the authentic cadence the same as a perfect authentic cadence? That is a great question. Let me do it this way and let's see if this makes sense. I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to start sharing. I'm going to give you a whiteboard. And I'm going to say we can have, ooh, we're purple today, an authentic cadence. And I'm going to have this huge umbrella. And then I'm going to say there's different types of authentic cadences. You can have an imperfect, which we're going to get to in a second, authentic cadence. Which is its own type of authentic cadence. And you can have a perfect authentic cadence, which is its own type. So they're both authentic cadences, but we're going to distinguish between the two. And the distinction we've made so far is that the perfect authentic cadence goes five to one, both in root position. And in soprano, for our tonic triad, we have scale degree one. This little party hat means scale degree. We have do in sop. Rano. We good so far? Other questions? Does Pac Man stand for perfect authentic cadence man? Yes. It does now, most definitely. All right, I'm going to share my screen again. Did you get your little picture of that if you wanted one? I'm going to share my screen again, and we're going to listen to some examples, of course, from the master, Johann Sebastian. Here we go. So this is a, this is a perfect authentic cadence, but it's going to be in minor. Example. Ten one. One more time, that was a lot to process. I'm not sure I like that example. Example ten. You hear it one. all right? Clearly from book two, he gets a little creative, shall we say, with the harmonies, book two, a little more than one. It's more noty. Yeah, for sure, and a lot more accidentals. So, all that to say, we went, wow, that was loud. We've got Do and the Soprano, we went five to one. Packs have been around forever. All right. The imperfect authentic cadence, IAC, is usually defined simply as an authentic cadence that is not a pack. However, it is useful to identify several subcategories as follows. We have, number one, the root position IAC, like a pack, but three or five is in the melody over the tonic triad. Here we go, another example from Well-Tempered Clavier, book two. Example, 10, two. Did you get it? One more time, looking at the pink That's box. Good. Yeah, this one's a fun one. Example, 10, Two. 
So we could die there and end kind of happy. I reversed that. We could end there and die kind of happy. All right. So we end up with scale degree. Three in soprano. We're in root position, though. We have root position triads. We just didn't get that scale degree one in the soprano. So it's an IAC. You with me? All right. Number two, the inverted IAC. Five, seven goes to one, but with either or both of the chords inverted. Here we go, Schumann, vocal, art song, Nachtlied, Opus 96, number one. Who sang this? Not me. Example, 10-3. back because I sang along with that and it was epic. All right, one more time. Example 10-3. So we had five to one. However, we did not have five to one in root position. No. So it's an IAC. It's all about that base, about that base. We need root position five to one for it to be a pack. Otherwise, it's an IAC. Doing all right? Moving on. A leading tone IAC. Now, I've been making such a big deal about the five to one. You could also have a seven to one. Isn't that true? Is that what we were told? Cadences, authentic cadence. Some sort of five or seven. So now we're going to talk about the sevens. All right, here, a leading tone IAC is some form of seven diminished chord going to one. Leading tone diminished seventh chord going to one. The diminished seven chord substitutes for a dominant chord. All right, here's a lovely example from Bach. Example, 10-4. Ooh, one more time. Now that we know what's going on. Example, 10-4. So, it's not an IAC because we went 7 diminished to 1. It's an IAC because we went 7 diminished first inversion to 1. You with me? If we would have put that bad boy in root position, it would have been a pack. But we probably would have had other voice leading problems. 
Doing all right so far. The root position IAC is certainly the most final sounding of the three IAC types. That was number one. We just didn't have scale degree one in the soprano, remember? And you might find some compositions that end with such a cadence. The other types are limited almost exclusively to less important interior cadences. So they're saying that number two and number three happen most of the time in the middle of a piece, but number one happens most of the time at the end of the piece. Remember that not every five to one progression constitutes an authentic cadence. Only when the tonic chord seems to serve as the goal of a longer passage, usually at least a few measures, would we term a five to one progression a cadence. This same distinction also applies to other types of cadences. All right, a deceptive cadence. The DC results when the ear expects a five to one cadence, but here's a five question mark instead. The question mark is usually a submediant triad. What number is submediant? Six. Six. You remember this, right? I've played this for you a bunch of times. All right. Classic. So we say again. It's a classic. Yes. <laughs> so we went to six rather than to one. Uh, but it doesn't have to go to six. A deceptive cadence produces a very unstable feeling and would never be used to end a tonal work. Oh yeah, want to bet? Remember that five to six involves a special part writing problem. Do you remember this? That's something to do with doubling something, something or other. Review example 6.9. Okay, here we go. Hmm. The progression five to six is known as the deceptive progression for reasons that will become clear in next chapter. Four reasons that will become clear in next chapter. In terms of voice leading, deceptive progressions present some special problems. In most cases, the leading tone, scale degree seven, moves parallel with the bass, resolving up to tonic, scale degree one. Whereas the other two voices move down, contrary to the bass, to the next available chord tones. The results in a, this results in a double third in the sixth chord in major. If the leading tone is in an inner voice, it may move down by step. Let's go through six as an example, 6-9C. Because the lack of resolution is not so apparent to the ear. This is not acceptable in the minor mode, however, because the awkward interval of an augmented second occurs. So, here are four deceptive progressions. A, B, and C are good, and D is poor. Here is A. So good. Sorry, G minor. <laughs> All right, here is C. Also good. And here is D, which is poor. All 
Are you seeing the double third? Where's the double third that they're talking about? It's in the uh, upper voices. So they're saying that the third of the sixth chord is doubled right here. Right? And sometimes that's frowned upon, but that's all right. Are we okay? Was that a good review? Did it confuse us more? Now we got to make our way back to All right. Haydn, Piano Sonata, number four. Got a deceptive cadence in the pink box. Example, 10-5. you think I think it's beautiful faked us out and then took us deeper to that E minor chord example 10 5 I want him to take more time though Cool. So a deceptive progression is often used not to really end a phrase, but to extend it a few measures until it reaches the true cadence, which in this case, the true cadence was a half cadence, which is what we're going to learn about next. Half cadences, you cannot end there and die happy. It's so unresolved unfulfilled the half cadence is a very common type of unstable or progressive cadence the half cadence ends with a five chord which can be preceded by any other chord as we will hear in this Haydn piano sonata example 10 6 example one more time example 10 6 when you played the happy birthday and then you did the deceptive cadence at the beginning yeah except 
That would have been six. Yeah, I said reminds me of. Doesn't necessarily mean that they did it. <laughs> but it shouldn't remind you. That's my concern. No, not the... Not... I meant the beginning of the piece. Ah. Just how they played it. But... Whatever. Never mind. Example. Ten, six. I'm trying to figure out why they use this example. And my thought is, is that this has several one to fives that sound like half cadences all throughout. Because here we have a one to five. And here we have, oops, here we have another one to five. And it begs the question, are all of those high, half cadences? And then the end. Anyway. So, let me play... Let me play a uh, a different piece that has a half cadence in it. I want you to all raise your hands when I get to the half cadence. So you can't end there and die happy. It feels so unresolved, so they call it progressive even, meaning we got to keep going. Questions on the half cadence? Why put a name on it? <laughs> well, we need to understand that it's a point of rest, if you will. There's kind of a release of tension there. Right, so, so you can't... Say again? I was going to say, you can't just slap half cadence whenever you see a five chord. Right. Right. It needs to be at an end of a phrase. It's kind of a resting point. So a lot of music theory teachers compare cadences to punctuation and sentences in the English language. And they say an authentic cadence is a period. But a half cadence is a comma. I don't know, for what it's worth. That's a good way to think about it. It's like you're not done. Right. Right. So you'll you'll start to hear them, Captain, even better. You're like, ah. Nah, I, I, I believe it. It's just... also find it pointless at the same time. But pointless? Not well, it's really not going to become pointless, especially well, especially I when meant, we're talking about your art. I just meant like they're like, oh, you shouldn't stop there. It's like, well, you shouldn't stop on a seven either. <laughs> but this is going to come into play when you start analyzing what you're working on in your own performance practice. Like when you start looking at art songs, you're like, oh, that's a half cadence. How am I going to treat that differently? Hmm, maybe I'm going to push my tempo. Maybe I'm not going to push my tempo. Am I going to breathe after that half cadence? You know, there's going to be some musical things that it's going to make sense. It's going to continue to, you're just going to continue to add and add and add on your knowledge and it, it'll become commonplace. You'll, you'll recognize them all over the place. You'll start hearing them more. 
So, okay, the Phrygian half cadence is a special name given to the four, six to five half cadence in minor. The name refers to a cadence found in the period of modal polyphony before 1600, but it does not imply that the mode is actually in the Phrygian mode. Notice, incidentally, that example 10-7 contains a deceptive progression, 5-7 to 6, but not a deceptive cadence because the goal of the passage is the dominant in measure 4, not the 6 chord in measure 3. Example, 10, 7. That's a great example. It's kind of spooky. Can you play that again? Absolutely. But before I do, we're in minor. And you know something definitely is up. And what they're saying is we do have this 5 to 6, which can sound deceiving, but that's not our end goal. This is our end goal. And it's such a great example because it's like, all right, something just hit the fan and there's drama and we can't end the piece and die here. We want to know what happened. Example, ten seven. What did you think? It was all right. Did we hear our, did we hear our Phrygian half cadence? Four, six to five. Example, 10, seven. All right, questions. Do you have to go four, four, six, five, or just I think four, I was six, wondering five? That too. I was wondering how common uh, the chord before it is. Let's take that out and see what happens. Totally works without the four, six, without the four. Right? Would you agree? I'm not going to whoop. I am not going to play this four chord. You totally don't need the four before the four six. The four before the four six kind of reminds me of like a Cadential 6-4 chord, right? You don't have to have it. You could take it out. But it's a nice decoration to put it in. It just delays the inevitable one more beat. And it adds drama Ah, oh, we have to end on that half cadence. This 
So it also it also puts importance of the beat to that half cadence by putting the half cadence on a strong or a medium beat and not a weak beat. If I take it out, I end up playing my half cadence on beat two, which is a weak beat. So that's another one of those things that adds even more to the drama. Cool. A plagal cadence typically involves a four to one progression. PC. Although plagal cadences are usually final sounding, they are not as important in tonal music as the authentic cadence. In fact, a plagal cadence is usually added on as a kind of tag following a pack. A familiar example of this is the Amen sung at the end of hymns. So you've heard this at church a ton, maybe, depending on the church you go to. Example, 10, 8. Question in the chat was half cadence aren't IAX. True. Half cadence are half cadences. Half cadences are not authentic cadences. Half cadences are half cadences. So we have authentic cadences, which can be either an IAC or a PAC. We have half cadences. We've got now plagal cadences. We also have that Phrygian cadence. But yeah. Half cadences are half cadences. Authentic cadences have to go five to one in some sort. Half cadences have to go something to five and be f at the end of a phrase or kind of have a release intention there. So that was a painful example. Holy, holy, holy. But you got the, um, just the intonation was killing me. But the amen at the end. So we ended on E. We went... Five to one, perfect authentic cadence, and then we added an amen on the end. So you'll constantly hear the plagal cadence referred to as an amen cadence, listening for that four to one at the end. Are we all right? Questions, comments? So here's the nice little charty chart to sum it all up the preceding definitions of cadence types are standard for the most part and they will apply to most cadences found in tonal music exceptions will be found however in which case the more general definitions listed in the following table should be applied authentic cadence contains the leading tone second chord contains the tonic Plagal cadence does not contain the leading tone, and the second chord is a tonic. That's the four to one. The deceptive cadence contains the leading tone and goes to a second chord that is not the tonic. <laughs> and the half cadence. Does the chord, the first chord does not contain the leading tone, and the second chord is not tonic. I don't know if that chart helped. I didn't know fives were leading tones. Fives are not leading tones, but they contain the leading tone. Can you go over a half cadence again? 
Absolutely. I want to make sure, though, that that last question is resolved. First, you said, I didn't know that. What did you say? I got conf it confused with it saying that fires were leading tones, but it says contains it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. So here's a five to one. We're in the key of C. My leading tone is B, yes. So the five contains the leading tone. Good. All right. We're we're going over a half cadence. Maybe. So here's a little chord progression. Forget that five, five, seven, five, seven to five. But we rest, we have a resting point on the dominant here. So what a half cadence is, is it when you, is, is it when you take a pause A resting point on a chord that is a dominant and it is not final sounding at all it's very incomplete but it's clear that we're taking a break it doesn't matter what chords before hit just it as long not. as okay so back in our book Where do we go? What am I doing wrong? Hello. Oh man, come on computer. Here we go. Half cadence is a very common type of unstable or progressive cadence. The half cadence ends with a five chord which can be preceded by any other chord. And then we had the Haydn example. Example. I don't think I checked my box. Hold on. You did. Okay. Example. Yeah, there can't Ten, six. Say again. happens next you can't just leave me hanging there uh, 
I gotta get home. I gotta get back to that final key, that final cadence. You can't just leave me hanging out there on my dominant. There's so much more of the story to be told. You know, it's like when your friend calls you, you're not going to believe what he just said to me. Oh, hold on. I got another call. I'll call you back. <laughs> what? What? You cannot do that. That is a totally half cadence kind of thing to do. <laughs> right? There's so much more to the story. And then you start texting, OMG, why did you leave me hanging like that? Get off the phone and call me back. You with me? So what's the difference between that and the Phrygian? Phrygian is specific. Phrygian's like an albino alligator. Like they're so rare, you're never going to, they're, they're just rare. There's, there was one at the Louisiana Zoo, but you never see him. All right, so Phrygian. There's cadence. one at San Francisco. Is there? Yeah, so they, they hardly occur in the wild ever. So we are looking for a four, six to five half cadence in minor. So those three things have to be going on. It has to be a four, six to five. It has to be a half cadence and you have to be in minor to get it. Wait, how could a four, six to five not be a half cadence? If it wasn't the goal of the phrase, if it just happened in passing and that wasn't where we were really going. So I almost hesitate even talking about him, but the book did. So we're going to talk about him. But the focus of our cadence hunting this chapter is going to be packs and iacs and half cadences and occasionally a deceptive cadence. But there is a chance you'll see the unicorn or the albino alligator. The albino alligator. There you go. All right. Are we good? A still more general but useful method of classifying cadences puts them into two groups, conclusive, which are authentic and plagal, and progressive, which are deceptive and half. See, they've already stopped talking about the, the Phrygian. It's not even in the discussion anymore. That's how rare it is. We're going to set up two groups, authentic and plagal, deceptive and half. Oh, yeah. We used to talk about the Phrygian, but not anymore. Albino alligators. And that's the end of that section. All right. Cadences and harmonic rhythm. Hey, we were just talking about this. As a very general rule, the last chord of a cadence usually falls on a stronger beat than the chord that precedes it. This assumes that the rate at which the chords change, the harmonic rhythm, is faster than one chord per measure. The following rhythmic examples illustrate this using authentic cadences. Possible credential 164 chords are shown in parentheses because they're not real chords. We can't give them their own identity. All right. So, cadence, five to one. Five's on the, the weak beat, one's on the strong beat. Three, four. Weak beat, strong beat. Weak beat, strong beat. With me? Ch 
checkpoint. Match the cadence type abbreviations with the definitions and examples. All right. <coughs> pack. What's a pack? Perfect authentic cadence. All right. What G. letter? You want G? I will buy G. Five to one, both in root position with the scale degree one in the melody over the tonic triad. Tonic chord, yep. A for two. Two, root position IAC. Five to one, both in root position with scale degree three or five in the melody over the one chord. Yes, I will buy that. Inverted IAC. F. F. Yep. Leading tone, IAC. E. If so. PC. Um, B. B, going four to one, good. Half cadence. C. C, anything going to five at a resting point. All right, Phrygian half cadence. Oh, we're going to talk about the albino alligator. Um, H? H. And the deceptive cadence? D. D. Way to go. You have passed your checkpoint. Nice work. Clearing my screen. Now you got to get it on the playback. All right. Which is a great time to ask you, have you liked and subscribed this video? <laughs> All right. Motives and phrases. Oh, ho, ho, ho. here we go. I don't have the folder I need in front of me. That's all right. I'll get it for next time for sure. Motives and phrases. A motive is the smallest identifiable musical idea. That's a motive. A motive can consist of a pitch pattern, a rhythmic pattern, or both, as you can see next. Our pitch motive. Our rhythm motive. And our pitch and rhythm motive together. By the way, have you seen the Animaniacs when they go and visit Beethoven? That one's hilarious. Oh my goodness. <laughs> All right. Of the two aspects of a pitch slash rhythm motive rhythm is probably the stronger and more easily identified when it reappears later in a composition it is best to use motive to refer only to the mu those musical ideas that are developed or worked out and or used in different ways in a composition a phrase is a relatively independent musical idea terminated by a cadence. I like that word, terminated by a cadence. A subphrase is a distinct portion of a phrase, but it is not a phrase either because it is not <laughs> terminated by a cadence or because it seems too short to be relatively independent. Essentially, a subphrase is a melodic event where a phrase is a harmonic event. Phrases are usually labeled with lowercase letters, A, B, C, and so on, as in example 10 9. Beethoven, Symphony Number no. 6.
As you might guess from the definition of phrase, there is a good deal of subjectivity involved in identifying phrases. What sounds like a phrase to one listener might be a subphrase to another listener. What? It's subjective? How are we going to do this? The first four measures of example 7 9 on page 100 seem to meet the requirement for relative independence, but the tonic to 265 progression in those measures does not provide a cadence. Measures 1 through 8 of the same example meets both requirements, however, so this is an 8 measure phrase ending with an IAC. I hate it when they do this in the book. Because now we've got to go all the way back to chapter 7 and look at this dumb example. Nor can the issue be decided only by find, finding cadences, because subphrases frequently end with progressions that could be cadences. All right, let's go look at this. So we're looking at the first four measures seem to have relative independence, but they don't give you a cadence. So we have to take into, effect, into account all eight measures. Example seven, nine. I'm going to let you listen to that one more time and I'm going to try to go find my folder of knowledge. Example seven, nine. All right. Good news, I found my folder. Bad news, I couldn't find the books that I wanted to go with the folder. All right, so what would you think of that example? There's totally like a resting spot, but there's no cadence, right? I'm confused as to why we were looking at it. We're looking at it because they're like, oh, this example's perfect. It's a twofer. It's a twofer example. We can use it back in chapter seven, and then we can refer back to it in chapter 10 and make everyone turn all the way back to that chapter and get double use out of our example without having to pay another pianist to play another example. So we're going to twofer it up. So, in back in chapter 7, we were using it to talk about the 2 chord, which you will remember is the predominant. But now we're using it to say, ah, oh, it sounds like a cadence, because there's kind of a resting spot, but we don't get a cadence. We have to have a cadence, either 5 to 1, something to 5, 5 But to we six. were talking about phrases, so why does it matter if it has a cadence in it or not? Because that's what their definition was, that a phrase had to end with a cadence. Cool. And... How long we... are phrases, though? Ooh, good question. Excellent question. Subjective. Everything's subjective. This is where we get into 
gray murky waters so it the pink box for a reason. say again i said it is called music theory for a reason yeah so the pink box it kind of seems like a comma but there's no cadence example seven nine There's a clear cadence right there. Five to one. Now, what I want you to start thinking about and looking for is symmetry. There's going to start to be a lot of things that are going to make sense. It's like, ah, eight measures. There it is. Eight measures and we got a cadence. Like we did in this example. Right? Zodiac sign is off. So you, I what, what don't sign? know about zodiac signs. <laughs> All right. So the definition that our book gives us of a phrase is a phrase is a relatively independent musical idea terminated by a cadence. My teacher, when I was in form and analysis class in my undergrad institution, gave us this definition of a phrase. He said of the phrase is the smallest structural unit of music with a beginning, middle and end punctuated by a cadence. It must convey completeness with or without finality. What about deceptive cadences? What about deceptive cadences? Well, they don't punctuate it with the finality, as you would put it. But that is a cadence, not a phrase, right? Yeah. He's still listing deceptive cadences as a progressive cadence, which gives partial relief from onward motion. His progressive cadences are half cadence, deceptive cadence, and a couple others that we haven't talked about yet, so I'm not going to tell you. And his conclusive cadences are authentic and plagal. And nowhere is there any mention of an albino alligator. So, I like his definition of a phrase, the smallest structural unit of music with a beginning, middle, and end punctuated by a cadence. It must convey completeness with or without finality. Versus theirs, our books, which says it's a relatively independent musical idea terminated by a cadence. I mean, they're similar, but I think words matter. Are we all right? All right, so that whole little bit in our book right here, what sounds like a phrase to one listener might be a subphrase to another listener. The first four measures of that Beethoven example we just heard seem to meet the requirement for relative independence but the one to two six five progression did not provide us with the cadence. So we can't call it a phrase. We could call it a sub phrase. But if you take all the whole example measures one through eight, we finally made it back to our home of tonic where we can die and end, end and die happy. Cause we went five to one. Even though it ended with an IAC. Because scale degree three was in our melody, not scale degree one. Then they say, nor can the issue be decided only by finding cadences because subphrases frequently end with progressions that could be cadences. For instance, the first two measures of example 10-10 end with a 5-7-1 progression over the bar line. 
but most would agree that this span of music is too inconsequential to be called relatively independent. We saw that earlier with that other Haydn example that kept going one to five, one to five, but that wasn't really the harmonic goal at that point. So it wasn't cadential. Also, phrases of 10-10 are often extended by means of a deceptive progression followed by an authentic cadence. Or they might be extended by repetition of the cadence as in phrase A of example 10-10. The final phrase of this minuet, phrase A prime, that little apostrophe means prime, returns phrase A with an added repetition of the first subphrase creating an eight measure phrase. Phrases B and C also contain repetitions of their opening subphrases, but with some variation in each case. Ooh, I'm dying to hear it. Here we go. Example, 10, 10. Did you get anything that they were talking about? First of all, do you understand the cadences they're talking about? This is a lame example. I'm just going to come out and say it right out now. Lame. What happens in line two? Changes key. It changes key. So that's a great example to show us. Let's throw a key change in to just make it a little more fun. Let's go to G. What's your hint that we went to G? It's accidental. Say again? Oh. Yeah, you're right. The accidental of an F sharp. That F sharp has no business being in C major. Now, could we just say that this is the cadence or that this is a phrase? Technically, but it's not the shortest one, so. What do you mean it's not the shortest one? You'd add, in your uh, professor's definitions, the mm -hmm. shortest phrase you can do that ends or that is punctuated by I think it is I think that's a prime example of my professor's definition right there we don't need this but little the next one is on shorter time. but it doesn't really have a beginning middle or end where this one does that's just kind of the end isn't it or the middle do you need the end. a beginning middle and end? according to my professor you do I don't remember all the definitions the smallest need, like, structural have unit a... of music with a beginning, middle, and end punctuated by a cadence. It must convey completeness with or without finality. Yes, the yeah, extra but... bars of this tag on. Say that again, but... Ethan. The extra couple bars at the piano section. Yeah. Is just a little tag along. Yeah. Really it's, just, it's just a repeat of this, is it not? 
Yeah. Yeah. And you, and you yeah. So it. why can't? Why is it all uh, like four measures with the anacrusis? Why isn't it just that two measures or measure? I guess well, this. I guess this is where the subjectivity comes in because it, it felt like the whole phrase was all the way to the key change because that was the whole idea, you know? Hmm. I don't think so. No? I, no, because it's way too long. We're looking for short. I'm going to play and stop where I'm arguing that the phrase is right now. Because like... They Is that too short to be a phrase? We have four measure phrases all the time. It's actually a longer one, I think. <laughs> Sorry. So anyway, I can kind of see their argument because if you don't call what they've called a the phrase, what what are you going to call it? Phrase plus a coda. I could be fine with that, too. What does coda mean in Italian? Coda. End. It means tail. Oh, tail. I like to think of dogs. You can chop their tails off and they'll still live. It's optional. You don't have to have it. Is that true? Could we totally cut this little tail out and go on and live our life? See what it sounds like. <laughs> Let's see what it sounds like. Totally. Yes. We, don't, we don't need it, do we? That's a bunch of fluff hiding put in there. Isn't this fun? Yay, music theory. All right. Let's focus on cadences for a second. Do you agree with all their cadences? We have a perfect authentic cadence. We go from five to one. We get do and the soprano. Five to one. Fine. No problem. Five to one. We get do and the soprano. Then all of a sudden we get this F sharp, which kind of signifies mm, we're switching keys. That F sharp doesn't belong in C major. And we get five to one in our new key of G major, and we end with tonic in the soprano. Why? Go ahead. Why does it say the key of G only starts there? Well, that's a great question. In most cases with theory, people, they say that in order to establish key, you need to have a cadence in the new key. We finally arrived because we kind of went five one to five over here or, or five to one in our new key but it wasn't a place of finality we're not in root position we've got the third in the bass well, that's a weak beat so we haven't really arrived at a cadence same thing We 
finally arrived at a cadence. Does it make sense? On we go. So are we still in G major? No, we're not. They give us our C back that we started with. And we have F naturals now rather than the sharps that we had on the line before. Now, I'm going to make my same argument down here. Isn't this just a repeat? So we could cut that tail out too. All right, but we won't. We'll fine. We'll go along with the book. But this is this is a perfect controversial example. You could argue one way or the other. And you know, a lot of time music theorists don't have anything better to do. So that's what they do. I'd rather perform. Hey, Doc, I may have kind of a dumb question. I love dumb questions. I've after, been asking him all day. After looking at the end, it has a half cadence, and then I looked up the definition just to check. Could a half cadence with a five chord be preceded by another five chord? If it was inverted? Yeah. Okay. Well, so the definition of a half cadence is anything going to five. Remember the Yeah. Chord? Yep. Yep. All right, cool. But, but I would Is say the five... I would say the the important thing is is that it needs to have that um, that what my professor referred to as the completeness. It must convey the completeness with or without finality. Finality in this case, without finality, and it probably is going to be on a strong beat because that's it where it gets really reposition? murky. I don't remember, does it? On the definition, it doesn't say anything about root position anywhere. So. Welcome to the land of subjectivity. Right. <laughs> Thank you for answering your question. I was just super curious because yeah. I was honestly like a little confused because like if it could do that, that opens the possibility for a lot more hair pulling. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yep. So yeah, in this case, we what do we get? What is this right here? Does anybody see what they did? Oh, credential. Credential six four, but they didn't even put the one. They just put a fat five there. This is this. If we were spelling out our chord, this is a C E G chord going to a G B D chord. That C has no business being in a five chord, but it is totally belonging to a cadential. So that makes it even more confusing, Ethan, because it's like, oh. That's just a five going to a five when it's really a one six four going to a five. That's why doing? I asked because I saw that and I was like, wait, that doesn't yep. make any sense. And I was like really confused for a second. Yeah. We are out of I, time for today. Catherine, go ahead. So could credential cadences be also half cadences? Absolutely. That's what this is right here. Okay. Yep. I don't know if we were ragging on them for being incorrect or something. No, they're right. They did it right. They just didn't label it like they used to label it, calling that a 164 in parentheses because it's not a real chord. It doesn't have a soul going to five. I want to like, have that as a gif, what you just did. It was great. <laughs> Watch the replay. All right. 
over and over and over again. <laughs> we'll, we'll pick up on this uh, next time. Cool. Thanks, Dr. B. All righty. Thanks, Dr. B. You are welcome. Thanks, Doc. Yep. Thanks, Doc. All righty.